In 1985, Bang & Olufsen released as part of their BO Vision range, the M20. This was the cornerstone design for a radical new television style. Gorm were the speakers that would traditionally be placed at the sides of the screen, now shifted below, allowing for a slimmer cabinet. B&O's wood finishes were becoming a trend of the past, replaced by plastic styling and high gloss finishes. The M20 was only available in a modest grey colour and did not feature a contrast screen. 1986 would debut the first true MX series TV, the B&O MX2000. Introduced in a range of colours, black, white, metallic grey and bright red, featuring a 20 inch tube the cabinet design of the MX2000 was greatly admired, especially the shape of the back, which was considered to be neat and visually interesting. To keep the line smooth, the tinted plastic screen was fitted over the tube face. The catalogues claimed that the tinted plastic improved the contrast and so the name, Contrast Screen, was adopted. Despite technical objections that the tube had to work that much harder to push the picture through the dark plastic, the contrast feature was popular and remained a feature of BioVision TV sets for many years to come. Whilst the styling of the MX2000 drew praise, the insides were not so warmly received. The slim and stylish cabinet could not accommodate B&O's chassis from past televisions and so, lacking the resources to develop a whole new chassis for one model, B&O instead opted to buy one in. The supplier chosen was Normandy of Germany, and the chassis was known as the ICC-3. Other manufacturers, notably Hitachi, had chosen the ICC-3 chassis for some of their European market models. But despite its popularity, the design was not ideal in some areas. Both performance and reliability were poor by B&O standards. The ICC-3 chassis did not have enough power to drive the Philips 30AX tube of the other BioVision sets. So a Toshiba tube had to be used instead. This tube did not have the colours optimised for European use and so could not provide the natural hues that B&O viewers were used to. It also suffered a short life as the strain of producing a picture bright enough to pass through the contrast screen wore it out at a greatly increased rate. Later MX2000s, recognisable by the model name being printed in white instead of orange, were fitted with video colour tubes which gave better results. Despite its technical shortcomings, the MX2000 sold well. By 1988, Normandy had been thoroughly absorbed into the Thompson Group and the ICC3 chassis had been replaced by an updated version. The ICC-5. The ICC-5 was hated by the repair trade with good reason as it was not especially reliable, was difficult to repair and originally came with a magnitude of designed in faults that required equally numerous modifications to correct. The first ICC-5 based BO Vision was known as the MX-3000, which was similar in appearance to the MX-2000, but was fitted with a 21 inch tube and so was slightly larger in all directions. Tube life in this model was very poor and good working examples are rare. The ICC-5 chassis was capable of driving picture tubes up to 28 inches in size and so a larger BO Vision MX model was introduced to make use of this. The styling scaled up well, resulting in the MX4500, which was also a strong seller despite its alleged poor picture quality and dubious reliability. A later model, the MX5000, included updated software to give optimum compatibility with the VX5000 video recorder. This model also introduced a popular innovation, the motorised rotating stand or table base. When I first got this b and I wasn't sure what model it was and I completely missed reading on the front the model number there, MX5000. However, 
the mystery doesn't stop there. The only label on the back of the TV is at the bottom left corner, stating type 3203. BOworld.org states that the type 3203 is an Australian model and is the MX4500. Emailing B&O themselves, they too seem to think that this is an MX4500. Either way, it probably doesn't really matter as the chassis inside is going to be an ICC type either way. The contrast screen is off, it looks a lot different, doesn't it? There's the four screws that hold the contrast screen in. There's one of the plastic strips. This came from the top. And there's also one here on the bottom that's still partially clipped in. I don't like it. I don't, I didn't feel comfortable removing plastics that are over 30 years old. They need to be removed to get access to the screw holes at each corner. There's the actual contrast screen, and you can see the screw mounts, the metal brackets, one at each corner where the screws go in to hold it. That contrast screen actually looks like, looks like it's got a lot of scratches in the center there, unfortunately. But that's basically what you've got to do to get it off, to get those, get those strips out. And be very careful, you push, push, push it in, and then pull out to the side and then just pull out altogether but not so easy in practice as for the rest of the back there is a cutout here for some sort of expansion possibly here we have some din connectors and some speaker connectors and right at the bottom tucked away hard to get to hard to see is the scart the solitary scart that takes the rgb and to the left of that is the rf in front speaker grill is coming off the cover from the side there unfortunately nice white and black theme on the back slim design as the video has already stated this is the matching remote for the TV the BO 1000 remote powered by three AAA batteries a heavy metallic based remote control We're inside and I'm admiring the neck board that's been divided into three sections to keep it very narrow for the case bonded yoke which suggests it's probably a Phillips tube often the label is absent or missing I think more missing in this case there's quite a bit of residue there where the Phillips sticker probably was and look at this foamy woolly mass here and this tube big big audio sock you can tell me about that but it's obviously B&O's way of enhancing the sound on the set. The gauzing cable is unusual. It's not that wound black tape style covering on it. It's just a gray coating. I bet the copper bandits would love to strip that for its copper. There's our chassis, an ICC chassis of some sort. I don't see any markings to indicate exactly what it is with a lot of boards plugged in, a lot of modules. There is a NICAD battery on that board and on the back of that board there is corrosion around the area. Add to that there is another battery poking all the way down there in green that also has corrosion down around the bottom of it. Not a good start at all. Check out this board over here on the side. Those parts on top they're surface mounted, but they're not the surface mount that we're accustomed to that come in the very small packages. They're resistors that look the size of a through hole, yet they don't have leads on them. They're just edge connected straight on. This is a great feature. The geometry pots are all accessible directly at the back of the chassis with the, a diagram above them to tell you what it does. It's quite convenient place for them to be positioned for the operator to make adjustments. The TV could turn off at any time. I have had some trouble. After about three quarters of an hour, it shut down. Then I turned it back on and it shut down again after five minutes. So once it warms up good and proper, it seems to be more prone to shutting down. Besides that, the picture is too low on the screen, although once it gets warmed up, it centers better. I've got Bubble Symphony on the satin here right now. It's looking pretty good. 
the picture adjustments for the television, brilliance is Bino's way of saying brightness. Then there's color. That can be changed here in RGB. Can't always be done on many displays, but the B&O will allow you to do it. If you go to zero, it'll be black and white. If you go up to beyond that, it'll be just too rich. Goes up to about 60. And then there's your contrast. Goes up to about 31, 32. Right now it's looking okay. I could take the contrast screen off to make a comparison, but I don't know how much time I've got left with this thing. So we'll just take what we can get at the time. But for 1988, you certainly wouldn't pass this up. It looked pretty nice back then. But you know, it's a good performer. The BO Vision range of 1989 had fallen somewhat into disarray. Across the models, there were three completely different and incompatible chassis, two of which were made by third party manufacturers. This was clearly not a good idea and considerable savings would be possible if the situation could be simplified. The answer was to design a Unity chassis that could be easily fit to all the models in the range with only minor modifications being necessary. A situation that had existed in the early 1980s but had slowly fallen apart with the introduction of the BioVision MX and LX range. The first Unity chassis appeared in the LX4500 and the LX5500 of 1990. It was also adopted in a pair of new MX models, the MX3500 and the MX5500. However, during the changeover, some MX5500s were fitted with the older ICC5 chassis. Fortunately, the new chassis gave the MX models some real credibility at last, for they were fitted with electronics of B&O's own design. The concept of the Unity chassis had been so successful that when its successor was launched in 1992, the original dimensions and basic layout were retained so that the cabinets for the various television models needed little or no modification. Owing to the sleek cabinets of the MX range, it was necessary to modulise the chassis into several PCBs to fit within the allocated space. The new chassis was capable of excellent results and reliability. 1993 marked the arrival of the MX4000 and the MX7000. Both were among the best to feature the BioVision name and sold in huge quantities and deserve a place in any collection. The story of the MX7000 and beyond is for another time.